Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to have be here to be able to talk about my research. So it's about nanocomposites, which I'll explain all of that as I go. But before I get into slime and superfibers, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself. This is nine-year-old Professor Minus, graduating from sixth grade. And I grew up in the Bahamas. If you don't know where that is, it's right off the coast of Florida. It's a group of islands. There's actually 700 Bahamian islands but only 21 are inhabited. And I'm from the most northern Bahamian island, which is Grand Bahama, and from the city, which is right central to that island, which is Freeport. And it's the second largest city in the Bahamas. I was a high school student that really loved anything to do with science. So I spent a lot of time doing math, and I loved art. And then I went to school, um, and I realized, I think I want to use this math and art thing. And so I decided to go on and get my engineering degree. So I started in one school in a pre-engineering program, and then eventually went on to Georgia Tech. And I played sports while I was at Georgia Tech. I played soccer and softball. So I was a student athlete, did all my degrees, and eventually got my PhD in polymer engineering, and then decided that I want to be a faculty member. And that was, came about by a lot of mentoring. So now that you know me a, a little better, now let's talk about slime and superfibers. So first of all, let's talk about slime, right? A lot of us know about slime. And I have some slime up here. I'm just going to put on a glove real quick. And so I made some slime for us today. And this is nice, gooey stuff, right? I'm sure a few of you would love to come and play with this. Not now. But this slime here is kind of gooey. It's pretty weak. It's kind of sticky if you see it on the glove wants to hang out with me forever. Um, but it's just a globby stuff. And this is a lot of fun to play with. But the thing that I want you to remember about the slime that we're talking about today is it's a polymer material. That's all I think about. I like to play with it, but I think about it just as a polymer material. So what's a superfiber, all right? I'm going from slime to superfiber. I want to tell you about one superfiber that a lot of us know about. The first one, it's Kevlar, OK? So up here, what you see is a bulletproof vest. And it's black. And that bulletproof vest is black because it's covered with nylon fibers. Nylon isn't a, isn't a superfiber. It's just a textile fiber. Feels really good against our skin, so we like nylon. But inside that nylon are these layers of Kevlar, OK? Kevlar is a superfiber. That Kevlar yarn when we weave it together into a fabric is super strong in that it can stop a bullet. And that's why it's inside bulletproof vests, OK? But the thing I think about Kevlar fibers, although it's super, is it's also a polymer material. So what's a polymer? For you those who don't know, a polymer is a long chain molecule. So I have a tiny piece of a polymer here that basically you have chemical bonds, chemical groups like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen that will link together to form a chain. Now this chain has 10 groups linked together. A typical polymer chain has about 100,000 to a million linked together. So I can't make that up here and play with it. It'd be too long. So I'm going to use a bead, a bunch of beads. This is kind of like a long chain. And I'm going to think of each one of these beads as those chemical groups that I was talking about, OK? So with my polymer chain, it can wiggle around. It can be straight. It can take on all kinds of shapes. And typically, polymers like to be in this kind of random coil shape. So this image over here, this is done by a really powerful microscope called an atomic force microscope, that those are real images of polymer chains. And as you can see, they're about 25 nanometers. They're pretty short, right? So there's a lot of these little guys in our polymer materials, our plastic materials, OK? So <clears throat> if you think about polymers inside of plastic materials, this is what you should think of. It's pretty gross, right? A lot of worms all entangled with each other, all wrapped around each other. That's what the inside of pretty much every plastic material is. So if you go home and you play with a piece of plastic, if you zoom yourself down inside, that's what it looks like, a bunch of worms. And the reason I like using worms is they're alive. The worms are moving, OK? So polymer chains in your material, they're moving around as we speak. We just can't feel it, but they're moving. They're moving, they're wiggling, they're coming all past each other. That's what it looks like in the material. Now, if I've grossed you out too much, the other way you can think about it is a bunch of spaghetti. So we have a big bowl of cooked spaghetti. That's another way to think of a polymer material inside. Long chains all together, hugging one another, and all entangled with each other, OK? 
So the reason why we care about this, and this is really important, is that once you have these polymer materials that look like that, they give rise to certain properties. Like, for example, the slime, super gooey, but the bulletproof vest, really strong. So if I look at those two materials that I showed you, the internal structure of those polymer chains is a little bit different. Inside the slime, all of those polymer molecules are entangled with each other. That means that they can slide around really easily with respect to each other. If you think about the worms, the worms can slide over each other really easily. But if I were to pull on one, kind of be kind of gross, but if I were to pull on it, it's a little bit harder, right? I have to break the worm or break the spaghetti strap. But sliding is not a problem. And so this kind of gooeyness here, that's where the slime gets its softer properties from. When the Kevlar, when I looked at that structure, all of the polymer chains inside that fiber align themselves next to each other like that. And that's really difficult if you think about it. How do I get a whole bunch of those worms to do that? All right? And so the polymer inside dictates the kind of properties that the material is going to have. All right? So that's really important that we understand structure because all of us have a structure. Our structure is our skeleton. We all have a very similar skeleton, and at the end of the day, it's the skeleton that gives us function, gives us strength, gives us a framework. So very similar to our bodies that we have this framework, materials, polymer materials, we have to dictate its skeleton to give it its structure and its framework and its strength, okay? So I want to tell you a story about a few fibers to help you understand how the properties of fibers and their skeletons go together. So here are three skeletons of fibers. The first one is the skeleton of a typical textile fiber, right? Textile fibers, these are the fibers in our clothing. These are the fibers like towels and sheets. All of these fibers have an internal structure that looks a little bit like this. Now, this isn't as messy as, say, the slime was. Slime is not something we usually wear. It just kind of oozes off of us, right? But our shirts and our clothes is a little bit more sturdy. So we have a bunch of chains that will be folded, but part of the chain will actually stay all entangled with each other. And so remember what I said, some of those chains are gonna slide over each other, and some of those chains are gonna be where we pull on them, okay? And the combination of both types of properties is gonna give rise to a property of 0.5 gigapascal strength. So what, what does that mean? 0.5 gigapascal. So that tells you how strong this material is. So I have a piece of textile here. 0.5 gigapascals is not too strong, right? Most of us can go ahead and break that piece of cloth. Everyone can do that. You can raw, you know, don't do it here, but do it at home later, right? Um, but you can rip it, no problem. That's 0.5 gigapascal strength. Now let's move over to the second skeleton. The second skeleton, if you look at it, there's less of these red regions. There's less of this entangled polymer and more of the straight chains. Now there's a few other problems with that fiber, some holes in it, some dirt in it. So now I'm pulling on this part of the chain and I'm pulling on less of it sliding with respect to each other. And all of a sudden, my properties go to five gigapascals. So what does five gigapascals mean? Five gigapascals is the strongest material we have on the planet today. All right, it's very strong, it will stop a bullet, it's better than Kevlar, but that's the best we've been able to do. So things like Kevlar, Xylon, carbon fiber, they all fall in this range. So these are our super fibers. The last skeleton shows where we hope to be. As a scientist, I wanna get to the point where I can make a fiber where every single chain is perfectly aligned and there's no problems with the fiber. But that's really, really hard. And we don't have anything like that on this earth right now. And the strength of something like that would be about 10 to 20 gigapascals, okay? We can't even imagine what that would feel like. But we do have some that are five. So for me, I wanna try to make more super fibers, okay? But I have a challenge. When I look at Kevlar, Kevlar has all of these straight molecules but they're made to actually be that way. Remember when I said you have this bunch of worms, how do you get all those worms to straighten out? Well, you make straight worms. And so Kevlar is a straight bunch of worms, okay? They make them so that they're always straight, so they don't have to think about straightening them out, but the process in doing that makes Kevlar very, very expensive. 
So these fibers, although they exist, they're really expensive. Slime, on the other hand, is super cheap. We don't think about too much about how much it costs. Some of our textile fibers are really cheap too. But the problem is there are all these worm-like molecules, so they're hard to straighten out. So I want to take this cheaper material, this textile material, and I want to turn it into a super fiber because I think we should have more options and we should have cheaper options because we like these kinds of fibers. So how am I going to do it? So this is my textile fiber skeleton. You all know it well now. And over on the other side is my composite fiber. So my composite fiber means that I'm going to put two different things together. What I'm going to put in that material is a carbon nanotube. So this is a model of a carbon nanotube. And I'll talk a little bit more about it soon. But carbon nanotubes are all made of carbon. They're all linked together. So they're really, really strong. And what I hope to do is make my polymer surround my carbon nanotube in a very specific way, all right? So what's a composite? I just want to talk about that just a little bit before I get into my research. A composite is a material that has two different things, two very different things that we put together and we get one new material, all right? So one of my favorite composites is the Oreo. The Oreo is a sandwich composite. The cookie has one property, very crunchy. The cream has another property, very nice. And some of us will eat them separately, and others will eat it together. Now, if you eat it together, you get to experience the composite, a little crispy, a little soft. But if you pull it apart, well, you don't really get to experience the composite, but each of the two materials. Now, why am I showing you this example? A sandwich composite is one way to make a composite, but the fact that I can pull it apart that's an inherent weakness. I don't want to pull my composite apart if I'm making a bulletproof vest. I want to keep it together. So while that's a great composite, a better composite is the chocolate chip cookie. Now the chocolate chip cookie, the chocolate has one property, the cookie has another property. But if I put the chocolate chips and the cookie together just right, it doesn't matter where I bite that from, I'll get the same taste every time. The other thing is, I can't get those chocolate chips out of there once I make that cookie. They're all together. I can't separate it out. So this is called an isotropic or random composite. And this is the kind of composite we want to make. We want to mix two different materials together really well so that they're always interacting with one another and we get really nice properties all around, OK? So getting back to my research, for me, my composite is has two ingredients, carbon nanotubes and the polymer, OK? And the polymer I'm using is polyvinyl alcohol, or PVA. It's the same polymer that made this slime today. So this is the slime polymer and the carbon nanotube. Now, I showed you earlier those pictures of the polymer chain. They're around 25 nanometers. And the nanotube, as you're learning about today, is also very small on the nanoscale. So it's really important that both my ingredients are similar in size. And that's why I chose carbon nanotubes, because they're very similar to the size of a polymer chain. Although this model doesn't show it perfectly. So nanotubes, because they're really strong, they want to stay straight all the time. They're like needles, OK? They just want to stay straight. Polymers, they want to wiggle, right? So if I can trick my polymer into thinking it's a nanotube for a moment, maybe I can get my chains to be really straight. And that's exactly what I try to do. So I came up with these two steps. The first one is I put these nanotubes into my polymer material. And what I try to do is I trick just the polymer chains surrounding the nanotube into acting like the nanotube. So that region that surrounds the nanotube is called the interface. And that region is very small. It's only a few nanometers in size. But I want to trick the polymer chains that are right around this nanotube into thinking they're straight, OK? And the way I do that is I have to give it a certain temperature. And what that temperature does is it gives the polymer enough energy to know that it can straighten out if it wants to. Now, how do I make it straight? I use my second step, which is I put some kind of way to align everything. I want to push everything and align it in the same direction. And so what I do is I incorporate something like flow. And when I put this temperature and this flow together, I give the polymer enough energy, but I also push it in the right direction such that it will straighten out 
and lay down right next to the nanotube to form this interface, okay? So how do I make that flow happen? I do something called spinning. So whenever a fiber is made, it doesn't matter if it's a textile fiber or if it's Kevlar, the process of making a fiber is called spinning. So this is my spinning apparatus. What I have here is I have a bath. That bath has got a certain temperature and it's also what I use to flow. And it flows down a nice glass tube. And that glass tube, inside that I will inject my polymer, my spinning dope. And that dope will go and get pulled along and eventually I'm gonna make this really nice fiber at the end. Now I notice there's three zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. And so by controlling temperature and flow, what I'm hoping to do is control what happens in those three zones. So let's zoom in on those zones. Zone one has all of the polymer with the nanotubes. Remember, the nanotubes are straight, the polymer is all wiggly. Zone one, they're just getting to meet each other. By zone two, with the temperature and the flow, I'm causing more of those chains near the nanotube to align and form this interface. By zone three, I've formed a really nice interface. Now that's my theory. Now let's see if it works. So we made two fibers. The first fiber we made, we didn't do any temperature control or any flow control. So we were able to make a fiber and we could see the nanotubes inside. Now to get this image, we had to use an electron microscope. Electron microscope uses an electrons and not light to get an image. So it's really powerful. And you can see the scale bar there. I'm looking at 200 nanometers. So what you see is a fiber broken. And the broken piece, when we zoom in it, you see these nanotubes, but there's nothing around them. They're just kind of sticking out. When I use my second recipe, where I use temperature control and flow, look at the difference. The fiber breaks a little differently, and those nanotubes in that picture, you can see it's surrounded by something. This is that interface that I was talking about. So we have been able to make it. Now the other thing about these fibers is the way they break. If I don't have any interface, around my nanotube is a bunch of polymers that have no structure. So if I break this, that nanotube just pulls right out, no problems, just slides right out of there. On the other hand, if I create this interface, now these polymer chains, they're trying to act like a nanotube. They're acting straight, just like one. So when I break this fiber and pull it out, the polymer chain tries to go with it. And as a result, this becomes really difficult. And you can see how it makes that like cone at the top. You can actually see that in the picture right there. So we're trying to make these strong. So what's the result? After making these, after showing our recipe works, what's the result? When we look at the mechanical properties, the strength, look at what we get. The control fiber is just slime. So slime by itself has the properties of about one gigapascal strength. So it's a little bit better than a textile material, but not that much. When I add in carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes are really strong, I get a fiber that's about 2.5 gigapascals. So that's pretty good. That's getting close to the bulletproof stuff. But when I control just this small amount of polymer right around the nanotube, look at the properties I get. Now we're at 4.5 to 5 gigapascals. So we are able to take slime and make it into a super fiber that's almost better than fibers we have today because those properties are better than Kevlar. So my work basically shows that it, it is possible to take the cheap stuff and as long as we control the skeleton really properly, we can get some really amazing fibers from very cheap materials. And so the reason why we want to do this is there's a lot of need for these kinds of materials. Our airplanes today have about 60 weight percent composites. And those composites make that plane lighter, and it, because it's lighter, it uses less fuel. We also could have bulletproof vests, as well as new cars that are light on the gas, golf clubs for those of us who are into really nice sports, and protective gear and helmets. So all of these applications require that we have strong materials, but we don't want to have to always pay a lot for them. So if we can make new, cheaper versions, then we can have more for everyone. So that is what I do in my research. I want to thank you all for coming today and for your attention. And I'll be around if you have any questions.